Inspired by investigations conducted under the federal Emmett Till Act of 2008, WKNO set aside this hour for us to talk about journalists and how they uncover racial inequality and how that affects our conversation about racism in America today. I'm Laura Faith Gabetta, here with some mem uh, veteran Memphis journalists. Karanja Ajanaku, associate publisher and executive editor for the new Tri-State Defender. Glad to be here. We also have Otis Sanford, who holds the Hardin Chair of Excellence in Economic and Managerial Journalism at the University of Memphis Department of Journalism. Thank you for having me. We also have with us Wendy C. Thomas, editor and publisher of MLK 50, Justice Through Journalism, a nonprofit news organization. It's great to be here. We also have Jerome Wright, retired editorial page editor at the Commercial Appeal and current deputy editor at the New Tri-State Defender. Thank you. Glad to be here. We're going to start off a little bit of kind of where we came from. Um, in the Civil Rights Movement, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. led us to the 1970s, which was a turning point. Uh, black journalists working for major city newspapers across the South. Um, around that time, the Kerner Report on racial inequality that came out soon after King's death said, and I quote, the journalistic profession has been shockingly backward in seeking out hiring and promoting Negroes. And that's when and where the careers of several of our panelists started. Um, and so I wanted to ask you guys, um, what led you to journalism? Who were your heroes? And uh, what did you want to accomplish in this field? Anyone can start. Well, uh, I'm an old movie buff, even when I was in school, high school. And I loved those old movies with reporters solving crimes, being in the middle of things. But they also made a difference. And I think one of my favorites, and still is one of my favorites, is called the Northside 777, which you guys know, I'm, I'm familiar with it. a very skeptical uh, reporter, James Stewart, Jimmy Stewart, uh, answered a mother's call about her son being framed for a murder. And she had saved up her pennies as a, as a uh, floor scrubber to hire an attorney to get him out. Anyway, a very skeptical Stewart didn't believe it at first, but he, and once he looked into it, he was convinced that uh, uh, the guy was innocent and was able to get him off. The guy was released from prison. Had he been in like 20 years? Yeah. So I, the, the fact that they were in the middle of things and, and that they could make a difference, I think, inspired me to want to do it. Yeah. And I also thought it was cool to see the guys in the trench coats with the cap hats and the press ticket. Classic, <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Well, I think for me, I was, I grew up on a farm in Mississippi. I really didn't have any journalism role models. Um, but my little poor high school did teach a journalism class uh, by a guy who was not a journalist. He was an English teacher. Um, but he inspired me uh, to, because I always wanted to write. My father loved newspapers, so we got the newspaper delivered to our farm every day. Uh, and so I just, um, I was just inspired by that. I read the newspaper every day, I poured through it, and I said one of these days I wanted to be a newspaper reporter, and I never wanted to do anything else. So that was, that was my inspiration. I went to college to be a football player, and that didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I ran into um, a sister who had a journalism scholarship from the Post-Dispatch. And then after my first year, my second year, I ran out of financial aid money. So it's like, how are you going to stay in school and keep hanging out with the sisters? And that, that really was it, you know. And uh, my folks had told me, you got to get a degree because no one else had, had had that. She knew about a scholarship. It was a Benjamin Franklin Herrick scholarship. And uh, she said, well, you should try out for it. I said, well, I don't know anything about journalism. She said, well, you help me with my homework and you know how to talk. And I went in and I got it. And so if you want to stay in school and keep hanging out with the sister, then you go into journalism. And that's what I did. <laughs> and I decided that I would be a sports reporter. I got hired at the Commercial Appeal. And I worked there for 26 years, six months, three weeks, and two days, and I never wrote a sports story. <laughs> 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 Yes. Now, you, you were a couple of de decades later, but <laughs> yes. please answer the question. <laughs> yeah, I, I think my story is kind of like Karanja's. Um, I went to Butler University with the intention of being a pharmacist, um, but I've never been good at math or science, so it fully wasn't like a well thought out plan. Um, but I'd always liked to read, and I kind of thought reading and writing were somewhat similar. And so I switched my major um, to journalism. Uh, I think it's 
a miracle that uh, we all either are or have gotten paid to basically get in people's business, mm -hmm. um, to ask questions that would otherwise seem impolite. Um, and like Jerome said, I, you do this thinking you can make a difference mm -hmm. in, in some way. You know, I think a lot of times journalists are criticized for being pessimist, but I think actually we're optimist because if we didn't think things could be better, we wouldn't, we yeah. wouldn't write what we did. We wouldn't um, tackle the topics that we have. It's almost like a calling. You know, people talk about ministers having a calling. Where in this job, it, it's a calling. It's a calling to tell stories mm -hmm. that, and tell stories that, that, that accurately reflect people's lives and to, and to make change and for the good, mm -hmm. and, but also flush out the bad. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, and tell us a little bit about the uh, institutions that you started out at. What were the, the challenges, the, the good things, uh, you know, just what, what was that atmosphere like at that time? Well, I was blessed, uh, and I'm a product of the Kernick Report, report that came out in 68, and at the time I started at the Commercial Appeal, they were looking for African-American journalists, and uh, uh, and I happened to have a reporting teacher who was the managing editor. And I talked to him about getting a job there because I, that's where I wanted to work. And he said, I'll give you a try. And about nine months later, he called and told me he had a job as a copy clerk for me. And I wanted to know if I was still interested. And I was working as a nurse's assistant at the time. At the time. So I told him, yeah, yeah I, was, I, was, I was there. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Karandra, when you were at the CA, you also had um, a, a beat that was focused on uh, the black community. Tell us a little bit about that, how that came to be. We had a beat called Minority Affairs, and we were all there, and we may remember mm -hmm. it differently, but as mm -hmm. I recall it, um, we were getting some heat from the community about how we were not really covering mm -hmm. the African-American community, and so Michael Grail was the editor, and we had a number of African-Americans really working at the paper then, probably more so than any time has ever worked there. So we got together, we talked a little bit about what we wanted to talk to Mr. Grail about when we got in there, you know. And so when we got in there, it seemed to me that Mr. Grail had a pretty definite idea of what he wanted to do. Uh, this sort of minority affairs deal, which I thought was just a horrible idea. I mean, I just, I just thought that if we were gonna get out and get into the, um, the yeah. century that we needed to be in, that we, everybody should be covering and we need to do what we need to do to help people along. But he just, he was, he had another thing in mind. And so after the meeting, I went back, I thought about it. And I went back in and I asked for the job. And he said, well, why would you come in here and ask for this job since you just argued against it? You know? <laughs> and I said, well, because I, I know I'm good enough to make something of it, if you can make something of it. And I know I'm not scared to tell you that if it needs to die, it, it needs to die. And so that's, uh, that's how we went about it. And we didn't have an idea of what to do. I called Sheila Rule at the New York Times. She was a, a friend of mine. And got some idea of um, maybe how we should go. So I started covering uh, the conventions, you know, the Urban League and that kind of stuff went around. And I found out about these maids that um, were organizing in Memphis. And uh, they would ride the bus from down on Poplar downtown all the way out and I just followed them. So throughout that beat, I just tried to look at it from multiple uh, angles. What we were doing here from an organized standpoint and just what people doing down here you know, just to live their lives and, and to try to make things better. And yeah. did that for about two and a half years until um, I thought it was time to, um, to evolve out of it. I also yeah. remember that Black Mosaic series you did uh, on that yeah. beef, which was yeah. just awesome. really telling. Yeah. It was about storytelling. And, and all everything that we do is about yeah. storytelling anyway. Um, but that's what I remember yeah. most about that beat was yes. storytelling, telling the stories of people who whose stories would never have gotten Me told too. uh in the newspaper had it not been for that beat uh and your willingness to go out and get it. That's what kind I mean. of features on everyday yeah. people in the community. Well, I mean they came to me with the idea of to to write a story about what's what it's like to be black in Memphis. Mm -hmm. And I just yeah. have to tell you, I didn't really think that was an easy thing to do is sort of like asking somebody about their sex life, you know? It's like, <laughs> you know it, but it's like, are you gonna really tell people? Or am I gonna really get people to, to open up and talk to you about it? And so uh, that was the challenge. Uh, you might remember Dan Henderson was the uh, yeah. editor at that time. I'll, I'll give him credit, it, it was his idea. Uh, but um, if we went through the ringer, I mean, he gave me grades on it, you know? Like, I had to get um, an A on the draft before I could get it into the newspaper, you know, and, but I learned some things about, uh, about us as people. And that was a great thing about that beat. Yeah. It gave me a chance to figure out, okay, well, who am I 
uh, relative to the subject matter. Uh, who am I as an African American person? And it, it became a profound thing for me. I mean, I mean it, it went from just being a reporter to, hey, I think I'm going to change my name from Leroy to Karanja, you know, that sort of deal. So it was life changing. Yeah. Well, if I can interject something you said earlier about when you first arrived as a reporter and I kind of felt, initially felt the same way, we didn't want to be pigeonholed to cover black news only. We wanted to get out there and cover City Hall, mm -hmm. have the police beat, cover the courts. Uh, and not just where you go cover this black event. And I, over the years, that changed. And I thought as a reporter and an editor that it was important that we got out and talked about the issues concerning blacks in the city and, and, how much and in did the area. And change, uh, Wendy, what, by the time that you got to the, the CA or, or Yeah, I don't not. remember there being, so I joined, uh, I did an internship in the 90s mm -hmm. there, got turned down my first time. I have to, they were like, yeah, you're not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I came back the second summer and I think all, I know for sure you were there. Maybe you have been like 90 yeah, you one were, or two. You were my intern, remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I worked with Benita, um, yeah. too. Uh, so, um, you know, by the time I got there full time in 2003, I don't remember there being like a minority affairs reporter. Mm -hmm. I think we probably had moved past the idea mm -hmm. that you could, that, that covering black people in Memphis, by, which by then was, you know, at least half the city population. Mm -hmm. um, that was not considered like a, a isolated beat over right. here. If you were going to cover the community, you were in, you know, by definition, it was going to be a lot of black people because of the demographics of the city. Mm -hmm. um, so a and positive you know, change in that regard. Yeah, yeah absolutely positive mm -hmm. um, in that regard. Although it's never, ever quite enough, you know, to me, still a lot of the people who were making the decisions didn't look like, um, didn't look like Memphis until, you know, Mark Russell uh, came there. There'd never been a black editor of the Commercial Appeal, which is just kind of um, really, you know, an in incredible. Uh, Otis really should have been. <laughs> yeah. Um, the first, you know, black editor, if not someone before them, that I, somebody before that I wouldn't have been familiar with. Um, but I think the fact that even that didn't happen is a kind of sign of how far we, we still had to go. Well, when talking about the challenges that you face in the newsroom trying to tell those stories that you wanted to tell, um, are there stories that stick out in your mind of, that got left untold or, or ones that you, know, that you tried to push that, that weren't able to, to make it? Wow, that's a tough one. Um, uh, unlike uh, my, fir my first job, um, reporting job was not at the Commercial Appeal. It was in Jackson, Mississippi at the Clarion Ledger. Like Jerome, I worked for the, uh, uh, for the Commercial Appeal as a copy clerk, but they wouldn't hire me uh, <laughs> out of college because they said I didn't have enough experience, so I went to Jackson. Uh, and there, um, I, I mean, I learned how to be a pretty good reporter there, but it still was Mississippi. Uh, and the stories that were not getting told were the stories of the uh, African-American community in Jackson to any great degree. Um, it was relegated to a lot of crime stories there. Uh, and, and there was only two black reporters. And I was covering entertainment anyway, so it wasn't, uh, I just couldn't do it. So that, that was the problem there. I, I don't remember when I came to Commercial Appeal two years after that, I don't recall uh, any stories that didn't get told that that if we really wanted to go out and tell those stories, now there were um, uh, skepticism in the in the African American community about the commercial appeal because it always had been there, and we were compared to the uh, Memphis Press Seminar, the afternoon newspaper, and a lot of people in the black community thought the Press Seminar did a better job of covering them <laughs> sure than did. the commercial appeal, <laughs> which. I think there was some uh, validity to that because the editorial pages of yeah. the press senator were a lot more uh, welcoming to the African American community than the uh, commercial appeals editorial pages. And that was because of what happened with Dr. King. Um, the, the, when Dr. King came to help the sanitation strikes, um, the editorial pages of the commercial appeal were, were, were not kind to him at all. They were blistering to the they, to the right, strikers. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they, and they, so that was a lot of distrust there. Mm -hmm. So I think the stories that didn't get covered were stories uh, that we couldn't get because there was this distrust in the black community yeah. to the newspaper. And to the, Thank you. To the commercial appeals credit, 
a lot of the changes such as courtesy titles and stop saying Negro when you name people and stuff like that. The commercial actually did first while the press seminar kept using those titles and, and everything. Right. And I never quite understood it either. That's yeah, why I, why I didn't yeah. understand Well, we're going to segue here um, to uh, go to a story that has not been fully told, um, which would be the, the 1940 uh, murder in Brownsville, Tennessee, of the first NAACP um, worker mm -hmm. who was killed while he was trying to get black mm -hmm. people to register to vote. So we're going to segue Williams. to that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Albert Williams. And we'll, we'll be right back. In 1940, 31-year-old Elbert Williams of Brownsville, Tennessee, became the first NAACP member killed while working to register black people to vote. Brownsville, the county seat of majority black Haywood County, had a new chapter of the NAACP, with 52 founding members, including Williams. It was the first NAACP chapter organized in a rural Tennessee county. The presidential election is going to be the next year. All across the country, Roosevelt is running, and all across the country, the message has gone out from a number of people uh, of stature within the African-American community is that we, that Roosevelt will be a friend to the African-American community. So therefore, there's this massive push for as many of them to vote as they can. At the time, Elbert Williams and his wife Annie both worked at Sunshine Laundry in downtown Brownsville. Williams worked as a fireman, maintaining the boilers that kept the machines working. He was the first man in his family not to work as a sharecropper, and he and his wife had a small house on Bradford Street nearby. I think it's in May or early June that the NAACP starts to try and go to the courthouse to register. On the night of June 15, 1940, a white mob led by two Brownsville policemen, Tip Hunter and Charles Reed, searched for the five men who had gone to the courthouse. They hauled one man to the Hatchie River, interrogated him about other NAACP members, threatened him, and told him to leave the county. Several others fled the area permanently. For a few days, it looked like the effort to register black people to vote was over, but not everyone was ready to give up. Despite what happened to his fellow NAACP members, Williams decided to pick up the mantle and organize another meeting. He confided his plans to Thomas Davis on June 20th, 1940, in what he thought was a private conversation. Around 10 p.m. that night, a Thursday, as Williams was getting ready for bed, barefoot and in his pajamas, the same police officers grabbed him and Thomas Davis like they had the others. Davis was released unharmed. Albert Williams was never seen alive again. They didn't try and hide who they were. They were in uniform. You know, had no reason to arrest this man. I mean, so the white powers that be had no fear that what I'm doing, as is in true in most lynchings that you look at. Annie Williams went to the jail to bring her husband some clothes, but the officers said he wasn't there. Early Sunday morning, she got a call from C.A. Rawls, the town's funeral home director, who said that Elbert Williams' body had been found in the Hatchie River. Albert Williams and his wife Annie had no children, but he doted on his sister's children. Leslie McGraw's grandmother was Albert Williams' niece. Um, he had probably the best paying job that anybody had had in the family, you know, um, with earned income, because he got $10 a week, I believe, at the Sunshine Laundry. And Leslie recalls her grandmother's memories of the day William's body was discovered. And, you know, they pulled him out and they cranked him out of this with, with some sort of tool. And they were cranking him out. And when, when, they, when he got up, we couldn't even tell it was him except for his clothes. Albert Williams was buried in an unmarked grave that afternoon with no medical examination, although it is believed he was beaten and tortured before being shot to death. It would be another 20 years before black people in Brownsville successfully registered to vote. No one was ever arrested for Albert Williams' murder. As a young man, 12, 13 years of age, I'd heard of the story. My grandfather in his original house and, and funeral home business was right, lived right down the street from Mr. Elbert Williams. So there was a cry that went out throughout the community that 
uh, that if you don't do what you're supposed to do, if you don't stay in line, uh, you're going to end up like that in the river. Future Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, then the nation's leading civil rights attorney, investigated Williams' murder and spoke out. The FBI's own internal review of its handling of the case found its investigation insufficient, according to documents obtained by retired local lawyer Jim Emerson, who was writing a book about Elbert Williams. The Williams case was examined again as one of 132 unresolved crimes included in the federal Emmett Till Act of 2008. But in 2018, the Justice Department closed the case, as it had many others, because, quote, the statute of limitations has long run on any federal civil rights crime, and there is no basis for federal prosecution of any other crime. Moreover, the absence of any identifiable living subjects or eyewitnesses, coupled with the fact that the passage of more than 75 years makes it unlikely that any living perpetrators or eyewitnesses would be identified. Relatives of Albert Williams and those like Jim Emerson and John Ashworth, who have been gathering clues to his murder, say the truth can still be uncovered. The group has already searched several unmarked graves at Taylor Cemetery in Brownsville to find Albert Williams' remains. If physical evidence such as a bullet could be recovered from the gravesite, Jim Emerson says he knows where Officer Tip Hunter's gun, possibly the murder weapon, is currently located. In 2014, Brownsville elected its first black mayor, Bill Rawls, the grandson of the funeral director who buried Elbert Williams. His grandfather also started a grocery store in the 1960s when black people who attempted to register to vote found their credit cut off at existing stores. To Mayor Rawls, the impact of years of communal trauma and racial discrimination can still be felt. Oh, I see it today because people are pushed into uh, neighborhoods that are built on fl in floodplains. I see the um, uh, education attainment. I was just reading an article this morning for some research I'm doing, and it talked about the, the counties in the state of Tennessee had the lowest education attainment in Hayward counties in the top, or well, the bottom five, not the top five, but the bottom five. So there, there's repercussion that goes on for generation to generation because of the mentality. Part of why um, I think some younger people don't get involved in politics or voting is because they don't see themselves there. Leslie McGraw hopes that more people will learn about her great uncle, Albert Williams, not just for his death, but for what he accomplished with his life. We are the descendants of this voting rights activist that, you know, did as much for voting rights suffrage in 1940 as Susan B. Anthony did, you know, in her heyday, right? And at a time when only 3% of Southern Black voters were registered. So I'm not saying to people you need to go vote today because Elder Williams lost his life or, or had his life taken because of voting, but you need to understand, if you can understand why he saw it as being so important, you need to understand those same dynamics are true for you today. Tennessee does not include Elbert Williams' story in its social studies requirements for students to learn, but does include analysis of organized resistance to Jim Crow laws like the NAACP. Leslie and other relatives hope that this native son, one day, will be widely honored for his courage. We're going to segue to, to be talking about how we account for the past um, and how journalists have uncovered racial inequality. Um, and one of the examples um, that relates to the Emmett Till Act of 2008 uncovering or reopening cases of civil rights murders. An example of that um, was in uh, 1989 um, at the uh, Jackson Clearing Ledger. Reporter Jerry Mitchell wrote um, an article about an unsolved murder of NAACP leader Medgar Evers. And those stories led to, eventually led to conviction um, of those murderers. Um, and I wanted to ask you all a little bit about um, you know, that being a, an example of a, a larger theme of journalists um, digging into the past to um, help us understand where we are today. How impactful do you find these stories um, in their coverage in the, the wider media landscape? I think they're very impactful. Um, and there are a lot of journalists who have devoted um, 
uh, a lot of time to doing that. Jerry Mitchell is certainly one of them. Uh, he's not the only one. Uh, a friend of mine, Hank Klibanoff, uh, who, had, uh, who actually did a book uh, called The Race Beat, um, he spent a lot of time uh, uh, uncovering and investigating unsolved um, civil rights murders. Uh, and and actually teaches about it at Emory University now. Uh, so yes, I mean this this is a reckoning. This is a reckoning that needs to happen. Um, I think in today's climate, uh, the pushback is that why are you digging up all of these old cases? You know, we have people who don't even want us to talk about uh, our racial history in the in the schools, uh, which is a shame. Um, but those stories have to be told. They need to be told. I'm glad that uh, Byron Dillebecker finally got, um, uh, you know, just, uh, justice was served there for Medgar Evers and Vernon uh, Damer uh, was another one, and there have been and there are others. Uh, those stories needed to be told, and journalists are the ones to tell them. Well, if you bring it back to the present day, I think what Wendy is doing with MLK 50 and the stories that that they're producing about the black condition and uh, sort of carries on that legacy in a, in a modern, modern way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. Were there local stories that, that tied to um, this trend, you know, where some of the Memphis stories overshadowed, um, especially when we talk about, you know, the era of King's assassination, um, a lot of times uh, this kind of uh, phenomenon of only looking to one leader instead of looking about the community. What, mm -hmm. you know, were there um, situations or stories that you thought were overshadowed um, because of that? I don't know that I could say that, but, but the, I guess the thing that comes to my mind in terms of, of anything is just Shannon Street, okay, and, mm -hmm. um, and uh, what happened over there, and I, I guess I'm, I'm still not resolved in my mind that that I personally even did enough um, as a journalist to try to figure out what, what was going on. And can you recap a little bit what that is? Well, there was um, an incident over in North Memphis, and um, a policeman, a couple of policemen, I believe, um, were, were taken hostage in a, in a situation. There's a lot of uncertainty about how it started, and but there was a, a group over there that they met regularly, and then there was talk about it maybe being a cult and this sort of thing, but it ended up being a big shootout. and. Uh, all the men in that in the um, in that that house end up being killed, and there's just a lot of um, speculation about what actually happened uh, in that house. And uh, you know, we did our stories mm -hmm. and everything like that. I know we did a big magazine piece, mm -hmm. and I spent a lot of time with Bill Thomas, you know, just mm -hmm. trying to track that thing mm -hmm. down. But one I, of the police officers, the other, one police officer got away; the other one didn't. Right, and the investigation maintains that they tortured the police officer and eventually killed him, killing him. And right. this gets back to the point Karanja was making about whether or not the officers who eventually stormed the house uh, intended to take those guys captive. Right. Yeah. Right. But there was just so much involved with that. You know, I spent so many hours listening to those tapes of Lindbergh Sanders um, and the negotiations going back and forth. and. There's just talk about you know whether or not they thought the world was going to end and, and all this kind of stuff, but but in a, in a way, it was just a bunch of brothers um, responding to another brother talking about hey w we can make the world better than it is right now and um, but man trying to get that story out in the midst of that time it didn't come out and I just don't think I had the skills that I needed to to have done a better job. Well and I, and I, I, that is a a classic story there that needed more. Uh, telling than it really got. Uh, this was what uh, 1983, um, and I'm not. I'm just not sure uh, that um, the editors at the paper at that time. The, I'm talking about the top editors. Michael Grail, who was the editor, was a great guy, but I'm just not sure that we had the, the kind of direction that we needed to really go after that story uh, in a way that would try to really explain what actually happened. I heard some of those tapes, too, because some of that wound up in federal court, mm -hmm. and I heard some of that. Um, but another story that I think really got short shrift, going back to Dr. King's assassination, yeah. was the death of Larry Payne. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, there's a guy that um, was murdered, in my mind, uh, and nothing ever happened. You talk about getting overshadowed. His death got totally overshadowed. 
um, there were not any reporters at the paper, I think, that uh, would have been allowed, really, to go and get that story. I don't know. But uh, this was 1968, uh, just before Dr. King's assassination, when that first um, march uh, turned violent, yeah. and he wound up dead. And the circumstances of it, to me, still remain cloudy, and I don't, I don't know that there's really been justice there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our uh, visuals director, Andrea Morales for MLK 50, she went back and revisited mm -hmm. that um, in 2018, so right. the 50th anniversary of his death. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're you're absolutely right. But to your point, Coindra, about the Shannon Street killings, which I remember just vaguely in my psyche. Like if that happened mm -hmm. in early 80s, I was maybe not even mm -hmm. quite a teenager yet. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know that then there was the skepticism, or even when I started as a journalist full time in like 93, that there was a skepticism of police narratives that there is now more broadly broadly speaking. So I think black people who have had an experience with law enforcement may have always been a little skeptical, but in terms of an institution, a newsroom, um, yeah, and just not trusting what the police says, I don't think that, I think that's a relatively, it feels like a relatively new phenomenon. And mm -hmm. I wonder if that had anything to do with how the Shannon Street uh, story was covered, or even Larry Payne, you know, that the, that the mm -hmm. police weren't, may not be telling the truth. Well, I think it was, uh, but as Jerome said, we had a police officer who was killed, and I don't think there was any, there's no doubt about that, he was killed. Uh, and so I think the community said, mm, I don't know about this one now, you got a, you got a dead cop here. Um, maybe there was something wrong with how the police handled this going in. They, they shut off all the electricity. It was in January. Right. And yeah. they shut off the electricity and then went in and killed everybody. But we had a dead police officer. So I think the yeah. community was willing to give the uh, police the benefit of the yeah. doubt. On that. But initial skepticism was against the cops who were able to hear what was going on inside that house when the police officer was, was being was being uh, right. tortured. Right. And so initially, everybody was asking why the officers didn't go in sooner right. and to try to save his life. That's right. And they really never really gave a good explanation about why, even when the final documents were finally released and we could see everything, never really a good explanation about why. Yeah. And bringing this forward a little bit, um, both of those stories had a thread of uh, distrust in police. Um, and we know that during the civil rights movement, police spied on activists, you know, not necessarily because they suspected them of wrongdoing, but just because they were challenging the status quo. And, and Wendy, you know, you found out a few years ago that you were one of the people that police were surveilling with a, a, a fake social media account. Um, and so tell us a little bit about that experience and how that affected your work. Yeah, it was a um, federal trial. This is the uh, ACLU. Um, it's actually kind of reviving what happened at coming out of the civil rights movement. Um, the city of Memphis, Memphis police were found to be surveilling uh, people. There was a, uh, y'all help me, 1978 78 consent, consent decree, decree mm -hmm. in which the police department said basically we're not going to do these things that are illegal. Um, Lo and behold, 40 years later, it's found that they're doing the same, similar things. Um, and among the, uh, uh, they were monitoring activists on social media and in person, and uh, I was covering the federal trial, kind of a re part two almost of what it had, mm -hmm. the trial that started in 76, led to the 78 consent decree. Um, I'm sitting there in court and I hear this officer who had been portraying a man of color um, on Facebook uh, say that he had been following me on social media. Um, that is, uh, I was surprised, but maybe not shocked. I think a lot of journalists who do things that are a little disruptive kind of just assume that they're being watched. It's why I make sure that the tags on my car are always, you know, up to date, you know, lights are in working <laughs> order. Um, you know, journalists, I think, are held to a higher standard when you're um, calling other people, you know, uh, trying to hold them accountable, um, that we, you know, keep our house in order as well. Um, I can't say that it had a chilling effect on my reporting at all, but it is uh, a little disor disorienting, you know, to know that you're in a city and maybe you're not as confident as you might want to be, that if you needed police services, that they would be as uh, fair, maybe, or intentional about helping as you might want. That's um, a little 
a little off-putting, but I don't think it affects how we do our job. Well, thinking about um, how you, when you were learning about those methods that they used, how did that affect um, how you approached covering like protests or you know anything like that? Yeah, um, you know, luckily I've graduated to a role in my newsroom where I don't have to go out on the street as much anymore. <laughs> um, but you know, sending my team out, yeah, we're really careful. You know, we have a line, a lawyer lined up in case anybody gets arrested. You know, um, in my phone, all my reporters contact. Uh, also, that's their date of birth, right? Because you need that if you're going to have to bail somebody out. Um, you know, we're just really uh, intentional about their safety. Um, and uh, also, we think about, since we know police monitor activists and organizers, how we show activists and organizers faces. You know, so right uh, last summer after some of the um, George Floyd protest, uh, there were some stories in which we published pictures, but we weren't showing people's faces, right? Because we knew that mm -hmm. police... Uh, are monitoring media to, for faces of, of activists. So I think it's um, just being thoughtful and sensitive to that and not wanting to be used as a tool of, of law enforcement. Yeah. Um, and the other story that we have that we're going to be um, highlighting actually is of Larry Payne, um, well, one of these stories that was um, overshadowed uh, during the, the time of Martin Luther King's death. And so we're going to transition to that now. One week before Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated in Memphis, a white police officer shot and killed a 17-year-old black boy. His name was Larry Payne. It was March 28, 1968. About 6,000 people gathered downtown to show the world that the sanitation workers' strike, then in its sixth week, was more than a labor issue, it was a civil rights issue. High school and college students were among the supporters who came to march alongside the 1,300 strikers. Local leaders invited Martin Luther King Jr. to join them. Dr. King was leading the march. Somewhere along the, the route on Bill Street, somebody broke a window. Windows were broken. The police who were standing by, just in case there was going to be, they were actually ready for some problems. Then they uh, seized the, whoever they could get their hands on. Um, the people at the front of the march uh, whisked Dr. King away uh, from, the, from the march, got him to safety um, as uh, violence broke out. More windows were broken, people were beaten with nice sticks by the police, um, and during the whole situation, um, away from Bill Street, Larry Payne was killed. Police reported some young people stealing from a Sears storefront during the chaos. Witnesses and police agree they saw Larry Payne running with a presumably stolen TV into the basement of an apartment building in the public housing complex where his mother lived. But the community and police differed about what happened next. Leslie Dean Jones, a 25-year-old Memphis Police Department patrolman, stood outside the basement door and called for Payne to come out. As Payne opened the door and slid out, Witnesses said he had both hands on his head and told Jones not to shoot. Jones said the 17-year-old had only one hand on his head and the other held a butcher knife. Jones then put the barrel of a sawed-off shotgun in Payne's stomach and pulled the trigger, killing him. Years later, Lizzie Mae Payne recalled she was watching a soap opera on TV when a neighbor told her her son had been shot. She said an officer put the end of a shotgun to her stomach to prevent her from getting closer and called her a racial slur. There was little reporting about Larry Payne's death in local newspapers. They were focused on the more than 150 people arrested and the fires that broke out after the march that was quickly becoming a blow to Dr. King's reputation of nonviolence. I think it was ignored because the local media and the newspapers did not see it as worth putting a lot of resources into. They bought the police line that it was um, justifiable. But in the city's black community, Payne's death did not go unnoticed. An estimated 8,000 people came to view his body on April 1st. The next day, nearly 600 people attended his funeral. They killed you like a dog, his mother exclaimed. Reverend James Lawson, one of the strike's organizers, criticized the police killing of Larry Payne in his speech at Mason Temple, 
moments before Dr. King gave his final address on April 3rd, 1968. They were only doing their job. But if their job requires that they stick a shotgun in the midsection of a 17-year-old boy who has his hands over his head and is saying, don't shoot, then we need... If this be their kind of job, then it's high time. It's high time that we rid Memphis and this nation of that kind of working because we don't need it anymore. What I feel like the story, the testimonies from the neighbors, the community informing the narrative versus the official one by the police, the disparities there feel like they ring extremely loud. Andrea Morales, the visuals director of MLK 50, wrote about Payne's story on the 50th anniversary of his death in 2018. You know, uh, in Memphis in 2014, there was a protest on the corner of Highland and Poplar the day that Darren Wilson was um, uh, acquitted for his murder of Michael Brown. That was the first protest I actually attended in Memphis. That day, I remember the police being lined up. They were kind of hemming in that shopping plaza. That shopping plaza was like much more active back then. Um, there was that record store in like a party city. And like the stores had closed, you know, all of the sort of sensational coverage from Ferguson and the looting, you know, became such like a fear mongering aspect that it inspires a city to respond by their property being protected over like people asking for like not getting killed for being black you know it's it it, it didn't feel like this was like a something that we had put down and picked back up you know it felt like an an ongoing pulling of a thread as in most cases of killings by police a grand jury said jones was right to shoot pain the boy's family later sued him, but the knife Payne allegedly wielded had been destroyed before the case went to trial, according to court documents. When you look at, like, the fact that they were getting rid of evidence, how could you expect this case to have a fair shot? It didn't have a fair shot, even with 25 pages of testimony from neighbors about what they saw. Jones died in 2019 at the age of 76. At the time of the shooting, he told reporters he was, quote, very sorry it happened. I didn't want to kill him. If Payne had lived, he would have been 71 years old this year. The difference today is video is everywhere. And most police departments, thankfully, are requiring their officers to wear body cameras. And I think that is becoming uh, one of the equalizers to trying to get at the whole story. There was no way um, that we were going to get the whole story with Larry Payne just because you had witnesses against the police. And in 1968, the media was going to go with the police, period. The U.S. Department of Justice reopened the case as part of the Emmett Till Act of 2008 but closed it again in 2011 because officials said the available evidence wasn't enough to contradict the officer's claim of self-defense. There hasn't been an official investigation since. So during this segment, we're going to talk about where do we go from here. Today, there's a renewed interest in, in understanding how racial inequality uh, persists, how we got here, and what to do next. And um, at the same time, the journalism industry is shrinking and learning how to do more with less um, to meet this demand. Um, and so for you, Karanja, I wanted to start out, um, the Tri-State Defender remained a voice for the black community and I just wanted to hear from you a little bit about um, why you believe the black press is still necessary today and how that has changed over time. Yeah, 
I mean, I think when I try to deal with this question, it's like uh, I just stress the fundamental, you know, and that we live in a, a democratic republic, and you, you have to be informed in order to um, to do well in it. And so you want to avail yourself of as many opportunities as you can to get information so that you can compare and contrast, right? And so uh, we're an important part of that. You know, we have a unique position in the sense that we're professional journalists, okay? And I want to make sure we emphasize that because like sometimes it's sort of like when you're dealing with African-American entities, we got to prove why our ice cubes are colder and all that kind of <laughs> stuff, you know? But we're a professional uh, organization, and but we're also uh, just a, an integral part of the community. You know, we're, we're not just some entity covering it, we're, we're part uh, of that, um, part of that, that, that community. And so, you know, we, we just, I guess what I'm looking for is this, I know this community is gonna come alive uh, in a way that, that, that it hasn't yet. And so what I see the Tri-State Defenders being uh, uniquely positioned to be able to chronicle that and to stimulate that, you know, because I coined this term, I called it objective advocacy, you know, mm -hmm. and so um, I take my professional uh, skills, but I'm not trying to play like I'm, I'm not pushing for the betterment of the African American community openly and, and outwardly in every kind of way that I can get us uh, to do that. And so in that context, I, I don't, it's not even a question of whether or not we're gonna be relevant. I mean, it's, it's just like asking, is the African American community gonna be relevant? Right. Yeah. right. Yeah, Otis, I wanted to, to shift to you since you're at the University of Memphis, mm -hmm. teaching journals, the, the next generation of journalists. Um, and um, sometimes it seems when it, in our media landscape that there were operating in different realities, <laughs> increasingly so. And so how, how do you prepare the next generation of journalists for that? Well, I mean, I, and I, I've been teaching out there now for over 10 years, going on 11 years. Um, and every semester I tell the students pretty much the same thing about being prepared to do this job. Um, you have to have passion. You have to be willing to, to do some things that you are not sure that you're capable of doing right now, but you will be once you learn how to do it. Uh, but you gotta have that passion. Uh, and I tell the students that, yes, the news newspapers are shrinking. Um, people are turning away from the paper itself, if you think about paper. Uh, but when you look at Memphis right now, and this is what I tell my students, there are a lot of opportunities to do good journalism right here in Memphis. And, and you know, we have them around this table here. You have MLK 50 that is doing um, a, a wonderful job. You have uh, the uh, new uh, Tri-State Defender that has some history behind it. Uh, with the stories that uh, Alex Wilson told and how they covered the, uh, the city sanitation strike that was totally different from how the uh, white press told it. Uh, you have these other nonprofits, and then you still have uh, the traditional newspaper, the commercial appeal. They're still trying to hang on there. Uh, you know, we, we still have affection for it, and we want them to succeed. But I tell my students that there are opportunities out there the storytelling, the the digging, uh, you know, being skeptical, mm -hmm. but not being cynical, uh, being able to uncover stories, all of that is still available. And there are still a lot of jobs out there that require uh, you to do that. And we want to train you and teach you in the new way of doing it. Multimedia, using video, um, uh, podcasting, using social media for good journalism purposes and not just for gossip. Mm -hmm. I tell the students all of that and, and thankfully our enrollment is up and we're, we're, we're sending people out there to do this kind of job in a lot of different venues. And also, um, because of this, this kind of fractured landscape, um, and the sort of polarization of American politics, you know, how, how do you see that um, affecting um, how journalists cover racial inequality today? Mm. Uh, last week, uh, I saw a study that was released on the 6th of this month from City University in New York that compared, that took a look at the coverage of African American events and people since the George Floyd killing. 
and it was pretty telling. And for instance, said the uh, black press was more likely, like one in every five stories had something about the African American condition, either good or bad. For the mainstream media, it was one in ten. Uh, when it talked about other issues, it's, it's, it was like 70% of, of, of issues. After American Press has 75%, 77 75% more stories about the African American condition than the traditional press. And it's pretty interesting. It went on down the line. It gets back to the question that Karanja answered about the importance of the black press uh, in telling these stories and focusing on these, these, these deals. And again, I go back to what Whitney has been doing with MK 50 uh, and what Otis has been doing <laughs> with his columns and commentary. And, uh, it's important, yeah. yeah. And Wendy, I want to bring you in too. Um, right in, in the, the motto of MLK 50 is justice through journalism. And I want to hear a little bit from you like what that motto means to you as like putting your stake in the ground of what journalism means today. Yeah, I think it's, um, you know, justice through journalism uh, is maybe just being more direct uh, about what I got into journalism to do, right? And so it's kind of like a, always a, you understood that I wanted to, uh, and a lot of us, I hope say all up at the table, wanted to do things to make our community better. Um, but just being really explicit about that from the beginning and believing that journalism can be used as a tool to you know, to pursue justice. I like your phrase, uh, Karunja, objective advocacy, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. because I do think that there is a way to be, uh, to apply the same kind of rigor in your uh, reporting methods and news gathering, um, but also be very clear, uh, things are not the way they should be and they should be better. Um, and so we kind of start with that position at, at MLK 50 that uh, people should, um, Deserve, they deserve to make a living wage, a thriving wage, um, on one job, right? So that we, that we start is that as our basis. So we're not trying to argue that that's uh, where we're starting from. Um, and so I think it makes uh, your purpose a lot clearer. It helps provide that context in the story, provide those, uh, those graphs and those details about the African-American condition, poverty rates, employment rates, and do it from a perspective of the most marginalized people. I mean, we like to say at MLK 50 that we're aligned with the people that Dr. King would be aligned with if he were still alive. So that's workers. We think about sanitation workers, but workers in, in all senses. It's people who are marginalized because of their gender identity or sexual orientation or their immigration status, their gender. Um, and that's just part of our, fo our focus. But we exist in this larger mm -hmm. media landscape um, and we, in an ecosystem, and we need each other, I think, to that's survive, right. to, mm -hmm. to survive mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I don't see us necessarily in competition, um, although if it's a big scoop, we all want to be. Like, so that's, <laughs> that is still a thing. Yeah. Um, but that we build off each other, right? So we're still small. We don't have somebody who can cover city council. So yeah, we pay attention to what the CA does. Um, you know, we pay attention to what other outlets do, what the Tri-State does. Um, and I want every journalist who wants to have a job in journalism to have a job. So we are all made stronger when the ecosystem is stronger. And, and to the point that Wendy and, and Karanja especially made, we are professionals here. We all are trained journalists. We know what we're doing. I mean, we went to good journalism schools, you know, University of Memphis, Missouri, Butler. I went to Ole Miss. Uh, and we bring a level uh, of, of, of experience, having worked at more than one newspaper, um, the, uh, the experience of being out there in the trenches covering stuff. Um, so we know what we're doing. Uh, and we bring that to what we're doing right now. We all worked in the same newsroom. But now we're out there in different parts of this community, still doing the work that we know how to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the community is, is really served by this, we call it, maybe it is fractured journalism to some degree, but I think the community is better served by entities like MLK 50, uh, New Tri-State Defender, uh, what I'm doing in broadcast and in uh, online. Uh, and again, what the Commercial Appeal is continuing to do. Uh, the community gets the benefit of this because we're out there doing what we know how to do as professionals. Well, I think one thing too is that 
bring Wendy in here because remember before the pandemic, we had a couple of meetings, and, and I think mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. you were the, the the driving force for it, where we got people from the different mediums. That I don't remember being in the room with these people before mm-hmm. the different uh, news entities to to look at how could we work together uh, on stories. Mm-hmm. And then the pandemic came in, and we we all just got into how we're going to survive, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that. Uh, we know we're going to make it now, and so I'm, I'm hoping that maybe we can find a way mm-hmm. to get back to that discussion. But they do it in other cities, mm-hmm. you know, where they, they, they'll find a topic and then people report it from the different different mediums, and the community benefits from that. And as, as you said, uh, everything that you could write about, particularly relative to the African-American community, both in terms of challenges and opportunities, is in Memphis, Tennessee. It okay. is. Okay, and yeah. so we should not only be covering it, we should be doing it in such a way that we could become a model, and why not be a solution to it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and obviously there's so much more that we could talk about with this, but we are out of time. Um, thank you so much to thank our you. panelists, and thank you for listening um, to us. Um, you can go to wkno.org um, to watch this and other local programs. Good night. <laughs>